Well, thank you all for being here. My name is Ben Olguin. I'm a professor in the English department, and I'm the director of the Global Latinidades Center, which is uh, generously funded by John and, and Jody Arnhold and the Office of the President of the University of California System. And this funding has enabled us to co-sponsor with the Carsey Wolf Center to have this uh, historical document that, uh, as you see, very much relates to very many things uh, going on today and also is a point of possibility for how we respond to a lot of what is going on today. And I'm specifically speaking, as you know, of the police brutality and the nonstop killings that we now get to see because cameras exist. And we're going to talk about that uh, in our Q&A. And first, though, we want to hear uh, a little bit about Ray's journey to making this film, his insights in this film, and um, uh, your whole vision as an artist, uh, as an activist artist. So to start, I just want to uh, just turn the floor over to you to, so you can maybe Give us a little bit of a narrative of how you came to make this film. Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank, uh, thank you, Ben, for inviting me. Uh, it's such a beautiful theater. Um, I was telling folks in the back that um, this is probably the best sounding theater I've been in. Um, the film was uh, finished. Uh, it premiered in October of 2019, and it was broadcast nationally in January. So we had like a three-month window to screen the film, which is very, very tiny. And then the COVID hit, and we never really had a chance to do, to do this. This was always the intent um, when we started the film. Um, in terms of its, uh, you know, I, I was sitting here watching it, and it's just so, it's kind of like all the memories come flooding back because this film is basically a culmination of maybe my prior 20 years of making films. And mostly, um, and I wanted to, to, to say this because when I was a, um, a student at NYU, I went there just trying to make films. I didn't really have a, an idea of what I was going to do. And then um, my girlfriend at the time, her mom was a lawyer. And she said, Ray, there's this famous lawyer going to speak. His name is William Kunstler. And you should go check it out. And I go, I don't know who, you know. They should go, just check him out. He's just, you know, he was Chicago, seven skin conspiracy trial. And so I just went based on this recommendation. And what it was was, uh, was William Kunstler, who was a pretty famous lawyer, a radical lawyer, and then Sophia Bakari Alston from the Black Panther Party, and they had a whole panel about a member of the Black Panthers, Daruba bin Wahad, who was in prison at the time. And I was so amazed to hear this whole story of this guy and how he'd been false imprisoned and, and, and all of this. And, I, and at first I thought, oh, that, that can't be true, all the things they're saying about this guy. And I started doing research, and that became the first film that I produced. It was a film called Passing It On, which was on the series POV in 1993. So it was my transition coming out of college. You're not supposed to make films when you're in college. You're not supposed to get funding. But, I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying it did, but we, we did shoot a lot of stuff. It, we, we, we began to see the school. We said, well, what are we going to do when we get out of here? So we said, well, let's use the school as a production facility. So when we graduate, we'll have something to show. So that's what we did. We started doing interviews with members of the Black Panthers, made these associations. We graduated from, from college, which made us legit. We could take that material, and that's what we used to apply to get funding. Luckily, we were funded by this organization called ITVS, Independent Television Service, the first year they were created. And that's how I got into the, the field. And interestingly enough, this film was also funded by ITVS. It was like 30 years later. But the process of it was me um, during my, my, my college breaks, again, I was just hungry to learn about the, the 60s, um, what had happened. At the time, there weren't a lot of books out. There were some, most of them had been written in the early 70s, but there was a big lack of knowledge. Since then, there's been dozens of books that have been written that have filled in a lot of those gaps. But at the time, there wasn't. And I wanted to know what happened. What happened with the Chicano movement? What happened with the American Indian movement? What happened with the Black Panthers? And so when, whenever I had um, summer vacation, I would, I would um, take a bus and go visit Chicago. And that's when I first met these folks from the Young Lords was about 1992. So I'm probably 21 years old when I'm first meeting these folks. And then when I'm meeting them, they're talking about, oh, well, we used to hang out and we went, uh, uh, we learned a lot from Corky Gonzalez in Denver 
from the Chicano movement. I'm like, well, that's interesting. The Puerto Ricans are learning from the, the Chicano movement. And then I went, took a Greyhound to visit Corky Gonzalez in Denver. And then Corky's like, oh yeah, we used to support AIM when they had the, the Wounded Knee takeover of 73. One of our guys was flying in the supplies of them because he was a Vietnam um, pilot and he knew how to fly you know, in if people were shooting at him. And so I started, everywhere I went, I started hearing, learning about these associations and these alliances. And so in my mind, I'm like, wow, well, how come no one's writing about this? How, how come nobody's talking about this? And in the meantime, I'm making other films, doing other kinds of work. I did some teaching for a little bit. I used to run a film festival for six years. And finally, at a certain point, I ended up hearing about this, this uh, member of the Black Panthers, Bob Lee, being alive. And he's, um, I remember seeing him in some footage that I had seen when I was uh, 21, some um, old archival footage. And he lived in Houston, Texas. I live in San Antonio. So I drove down to meet Bob Lee, and then he just laid it all out. We had a Rainbow Coalition. It was the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, um, Young Patriots. And this is what we did. And then, so to me, that's a story. So I began to produce this film. Now, the problem was is that since there was no primary research, there was not any book written about the Rainbow Coalition, there is no book today that tells you about this coalition, I had to kind of start from scratch. And so I started you know, doing primary interviews, trying to learn what happened and who the, what actually took place and who the leaders were and who the people were. And, and when I started applying for funding, the funders would say, oh, this is a pretty interesting story, but what does it have to do with today? So that was like the first five years. And so again, this film took 12 years to make. So it's a very frustrating process to, to be, be told a film that you think is so important, just the funders are just not understanding or getting it. And what happened was that the, the film stayed the same, but the nation started changing. So this is, um, I don't know the year, maybe uh, 2016, 2015, is when they had the whole movement to um, tear down the Confederate monuments. So it was a lot of talk about the South and about the Confederacy and about the Confederate flag. And then that's when my proposal started getting traction. Because people were saying, well, well, here's a film about the Black Panthers working with these folks with the Confederate flag. And why was that possible? How come they did that? And so I eventually ended up getting the funding to make the film. And um, once we got the funding, of course, everything <laughs> happened pretty quick. It was a two-year process. We finished it, got it out there. And um, one of the things is, for um, people that are trying to make these films about the 60s is that that generation is of an age where they're, um, you know, they're starting to pass away. Um, so you see in the film Bob Lee, uh, Bobby McGinnis, who's in there, who's the gentleman holding up the, the Rainbow Coalition button, he, he's passed away too. And even some of the photographers that some of the, I relied on, they, they passed away in the process of making the film. So, the possibility of recording that history is becoming less and less. So we have, um, you know, this little window to try to capture those stories. If, um, if, you're, if, if we're interested in them, we, we still have that window, but it's very small now. You, you know, uh, just on that note, I'm going to return to a few points you make, but we actually intended to have this event two years ago. Uh, it's delayed uh, because of the pandemic. When I mean, we were going to have uh, Kathleen Cleaver and Chacha Jimenez, who really can't travel anymore, but that was the plan at the MCC. Um, and unfortunately, that, that was not possible. But you have this now for posterity. Uh, and I uh, just want to return a little bit to your vision of filmmaking, because you described your roots really as, you know, humbly uh, and naive, but also in terms of guerrilla filmmaking. You're requisitioning resources from an institution to do the things you're going to do. And in the process, of making this film, you know, in fits and starts, you were doing a lot of other things. Uh, you know, you did New Eurekan Poets uh, Cafe, you did Voices from Texas, you did a whole bunch of profiles of, of authors that I think you helped bring to the fore. A lot of Chicana authors from, from Texas, from San Antonio specifically, um, are featured in, in, in that film, and also some, some uh, Chicano prisoners. Uh, and uh, so you were doing work that's grounded in the grassroots. And I'm wondering if, if you've distilled for us, uh, or for yourself, that you can share for us, uh, a philosophy of filmmaking. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, third cinema, but I, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you know, uh, 
why do you make these films? You know, how do you make sense of dedicating your life to making the films about the underclass in, in, in rebellion? Well, it's basically, these are the films that I, I want to see. Um, again, going back, I, had, I remember going to the, this is, I was 20 years old, going to the New York Public Library and trying, picking up all these books about, you know, Chicanos. And when I went to the thing, they were like, these are all reference books. You can't check out any of these. And I'm like, well, like, I have to read them here in the, in the library? And so that's, I mean, with these journeys, it was like, so to me, if I had to learn, I had to learn directly. And so the, 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 the option wasn't there for books. That's why whenever these books are written, like, thank you, now this next generation, they can learn about what happened. And so I think it's, it's like when I did going to um, the New York and Poets Cafe, that was a little different. I mean, there was, it was two blocks away from where I lived in New York. And I just loved, that's when I started getting into poetry. I started, um, uh, part of that, I mean, Corky Gonzalez with the I Am Joaquin. I mean, that was a very influential poem for me, being a young person at that time. And then the whole New Yorkian voice was just, and there was a connection there between the New Yorkians and me as a Chicano in terms of, you know, the New Yorkians, sometimes they're not accepted by the Puerto Ricans because they don't speak Spanish, you know, impeccably. And that's also the Chicano experience in some ways. Um, so I got a, I, a lot of my friends were the New Yorkians. And so I wanted to tell those stories. Um, anything I thought was dynamic or anyone who I think is interesting, those are usually the films that I'll, I'll start making a, a film about. It's just if I find something or a story that I think is, um, um, that I want to see, I'll commit myself to it knowing that I'm committing myself to however length of time it'll take to finish the film. A lot of times for the short films, I know it's like three months or four months. But for a film like this, when you take on a big film, you're committed. So this film had to get made, and I'm glad it did. It barely got made. Um, and sometimes, I mean, there were a couple moments where I really thought it would not get made. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough business, um, documentary. And so one of the things I've done is I try to, I, we talked about this at lunch, I try to lower my overhead, and I try to learn. So now I can do my own videography. I can work alone, is what I'm trying to say, if I need to. And that's not because I, I'm a loner. It's because it costs money to hire people to work with you. And I'm trying to figure out the best way to make, it, to make the films I want to make with as little money as possible, because that seems like that's the reality that I'm living in. There's not anybody on the sidelines waiting to give me a lot of money. So, um, it's a, but this is true of all the, most of the documentarians out there. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to get them made. So they're labors of love, the works you do, but they're also ideological spectacles. And I, you know, if you don't mind me sharing a little bit, you know, we both come from, from, from very poor backgrounds. Uh, you know, you're from the projects in, in Los Angeles or out in the outskirts of Los Angeles, community college, and then NYU. You're telling the stories of our people. And I'm not talking about Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx people. I'm talking about poor people. And so the films you want to see are the films that, that poor people want to see. And, and more importantly, I think, uh, they're films that we're surprised about, that is, uh, what we see in the films. And let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, the, this, this particular film here uh, really presents in a way that I, I have never seen anywhere in any, anything, any film, any political party, any organization uh, where so many different people that you would never expect to see in a room uh, are talking together as, as, as family, as people you know, in, in the same boat. Poor whites, poor browns, poor yeah, every color, poor black, poor, you know. Uh, and, and that story is very palpable here uh, you know, the, we'll talk about the, the Hollywood version in a second, but uh, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that dimension, uh, the multiracial revolutionary possibilities and realities that were going on there. If you can comment about what uh, you saw there as you were making the film and how that might even, uh, or how that led you to see other instances where that was going on uh, even up to the present? Basically, by making the film, you know, whenever you make one, like, the, at the end, you wish you could start be at the beginning, like, you can start over, because <laughs> you've learned so much by the end that you, you know, you want to reassess everything you've done. Um, and make, by the time I got to the end, I started thinking, oh, there's, there's another coalition, there's another one. I was trying to figure, you know, it was sort of expi spiraling out of control. 
about how many coalitions they were, and every community had a coalition. So the way I try to phrase it is, okay, this is an example, this is a story of a coalition, but it really is, a, that philosophy of coalition building was happening everywhere. There was, mm -hmm. I can't think of any community where it wasn't happening. It wasn't most, you wouldn't necessarily find this kind of like three people, three groups. This was unique. Um, but you know, most of the times, again, it was either the, for example, the Black Panther Party helping the Ewer Kern in Oakland, and even SDS helping the Ewer Kern, which was the, the youngest organization coming out, just in terms of simple things like uh, printing. SDS had a printing press, so they would allow the Ewer Kern to print out their printer on the SDS, a Students for Democratic Society printing press. So sometimes it was supporting, it wasn't necessarily an alliance, but you had these sort of, everyone was aware of what the other movements were doing, and there was, there were efforts to try to support each other, but everyone's, you know, seat of their pants. I mean, to think about it, the Black Panthers you see in this film, they're not getting paid, you know? They're all living in, like, communal housing because that's a, the cheapest way to live. You know, so you have 10 people living in an apartment. None of them are getting paid, um, you know, sharing food, and you know, bi you know, so if you were a cook, and everyone had to be a cook in some ways because they were, you know, eating, like, rice and beans, really basic things. Um, it's hard to build coalitions and, unless you have that infrastructure, but people wanted to do it, and I think there was um, a possibility of doing it. If, of course, you had a, that's when you begin, the rise of the coalitions coincides with the rise of the repression against the movements. So it just wasn't to be. It just, it was like, they were both on a collision course. And that's what you see in this film. In this one example, you see, you know, that once, 10 days after, there was a photo of, that's in the, that's in the um, a photo session where you see everybody lined up and they're having that press conference is when the field office of the FBI in Chicago requests permission to begin counterintelligence operations against the Rainbow Coalition, 10 days after their press conference. And within six months, the whole thing's, I mean, Fred Hampton's killed. Uh, Reverend Bruce Johnson's killed, which is an unsolved murder. We don't know who did that, but you have all this extreme violence happening and it's, um, extreme repression, uh, and, you know, People would be picked up, they'd be arrested, they'd be beaten up if they could get, be, get beaten up. And this is constantly happening. So people are getting afraid. People are, who were, um, sometimes they're called rally, rally lords or rally panthers. They would show up for rallies. They would, less people were showing up for rallies because they were afraid of the police beating them up. And that, uh, that, and that, that was preceded with Martin Luther King's murder his assassination just before the Poor People's March on Washington that involved another coalition. Um, and uh, so the repression is sort of a, really a, 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 a marker of the possibilities of what is happening and that had to be stopped if we were to preserve a, a capitalist imperialist society, right? Uh, that's predicated on, on, on racism to, as, as the glue that keeps it moving in a hierarchical fashion. Uh, but the paradigm this is not just an instance, it's a paradigm and I'm, I'm so grateful that you put all these snapshots of other movements. I mean, Laura Pulido has a great book on LA coalitions called, I think it's called Red, Yellow, Black and Left or something like that. Uh, and it's a, a yet another coalition. There's coalitions in Houston, Oakland, uh, involved coalition. You had the, the war, war, what's it called, the organization? You were current? You were current, yeah. Which became League of Revolutionary Stru Struggle, with, revolutionary, multiracial organization that had a, somewhat of a Maoist philosophy. Uh, they published a, a newspaper that was called, interestingly enough, Unity. So these were, this was a paradigm. I want to I want to suggest that it doesn't, it, it's not a, a, an archaeological specimen. I, I want to suggest that it's still here. It's still present. We're seeing a lot of things happening despite a lot of complications with Black Lives Matter. Uh, there is, right now, you're not necessarily seeing this type of revolutionary coalitions, but multiracial possibilities. Uh, I think people, once they see this film, it, it's, a, it, it's a reminder of, again, the possibilities and the challenges, right? Uh, I don't know that I can organize with somebody who wears the, the stars and bars. That, I'm, I'm from Texas, and I just can't get what that means out of my head. Uh, so it, takes a, it took a, some, some mature ideological maturity and some organizational 
brilliance. And you brought that out. Let me ask you another, a, a, another thing, since many of us have already seen uh, the Hollywood version, right? And that's uh, Ju- uh, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. And the question that I have is this. Uh, what, what does documentary filmmaking enable you to do that Hollywood does not, that, that, that Hollywood film did not? Uh, I have, I'll tell you after I hear from you what, what, I, what, what, it, what I saw that was different, but I, I, I want to hear what, what you have to say first. Well, it just, you know, for me, I just, I, again, I was going back to my own personal growth or development, is I wanted to meet the people in person, and I wanted to hear their voice in person, I wanted to hear their thoughts in person. A documentary allows that. You're hearing them speak. You're, you're hearing their thoughts. You're seeing them. And, you know, they look like other people in the community that, you know, I've seen and met before. Uh, you mentioned about our, our background. I mean, I was able to connect with these folks because I come from a similar background, even though I'm much younger. Um, so there's some connections there. Um, in terms of the, the fiction film, I mean, the, 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 the one thing, there were two things that, that I, I don't want to critique because I'm glad that they made the film. Uh, because, again, anyone, I think everyone needs to know about Fred Hampton and his you know, amazing leadership abilities. Mm-hmm. And hopefully you go back and read his speeches, you know, because you see the, 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 the mind behind um, mm-hmm. the, his leadership. But, um, for example, they, just briefly, they do talk about the Rainbow Coalition and the Judas and the Black Messiah. They talk about Chacha Jimenez. You see him in the film, and he's dark-skinned, and he's speaking, but he's speaking with a New Yorkian accent. And Chacha's from Chicago, and you see him. He's light-skinned with blue eyes. And, and so it was like, why would you change someone when you know what he really looks like? Because, you know, he's still alive. So that was odd. Um, and the other thing was, um, they, 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 there was a whole section where they talk about the Messiah, the FBI Messiah um, memorandum that talks about, you know, we must prevent the rise of a black messiah that will unify and electrify the black community. That, was, that came out in 1966. Fred Hampton was like just coming out of high school. That memorandum was specifically speaking about Stokely Car- Carmichael. But in the film, it makes it sound like, oh, well, they're talking about Fred Hampton. Um, and so but the, the importance of that memorandum is they actually wanted to stop all of the black leadership, which did include Fred Hampton later. But they didn't, know, they didn't know about Fred Hampton in 66, I don't think. Um, and so that was just my, I was like, well, why are they talking about him specifically? And I think it's more important to realize that the FBI wanted to stop any leader of the Black Panthers, as opposed to saying they wanted to stop Fred, because they didn't want to stop Fred, but they wanted to stop anybody. If there was any other leader, they were going to go do the same thing, use the same efforts that they did against Fred Hampton. He was the last big chapter of the Black Panthers. All the other... Um, Bobby Seale was in prison, and Huey P. P. Neal was in prison. I mean, the, all the, the Black Panthers were up against the wall at the time of, um, of Hampton's murder. So it was, this was the last of the big chapters to go after, and that's why I think there was so much effort. Well, that, that, that resonates a lot with me uh, in terms of just what you said just a little while ago about hearing their voices, because one of the things that you did that the that uh, the other film could not do is that you gave us palpable human beings who are ordinary people, recognizable people, people in our neighborhoods and our families, and it made revolution real. Because if they could do it, these damn fools getting arrested all the time, that's my tío, that's my primo, my prima. It's like, that's a real possibility. And you gave us the whole arc of a story. There's nothing more intimate than a person's sharing their death with you, right? And, and you have that there, uh, and that's, the, as, 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 uh, as Lee is, 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 is passing away, right? You have all the, the, the revolutionaries getting together again in the present, reminding us ordinary human beings did this. Ordinary human beings waged revolution, and revolution isn't just about the victory, it's about the waging of it, right? And they taught us that, and, and uh, in, in, you know, for those who were there, uh, they got to see and live that. We don't, but we see that here, and it makes it real palpable. They're real human beings, and that's what I think that that, that your film does. You know, that's what I think that that, that your documentary style does. Um, uh, now let's get to the cheese man. What did you What did you <laughs> learn in the making of this? Uh, what insights that we don't know about uh, that that you were able to, to, to discern um, as you were doing the research, doing the filming, talking to people? Uh, 
But this is just one thing that's kind of, um, again, the film took 12 years to make. Then the last year was just incredibly stressful, incredibly difficult. Um, you know, the, um, the archives went over budget by a lot, so we had to raise additional money. And again, the, the fear is, oh, is this film going to get made? Um, but looking back, one of the things that I keep remembering, and I, I mentioned your story, is that, you know, sometimes when we don't hear about what happened, is because a lot of these folks were, you know, and are experiencing the post-traumatic stress from being an activist during that time. Hi Thurman is in this film now, but for like 40 years, he was working at like one of the auto zones or something like that. Nobody knew he was an activist. He just, you know, he didn't want anyone to know who he was because they're trying, everyone's trying to hide out because the notoriety of being in these group, groups, and he went back to live in the South. You know, if you're living back in the South and someone finds out that you were, you know, in coalition with the Black Panther Party, it's, it puts you in a, in a perhaps a dangerous position. Um, about four or five days ago, someone from the Young Patriots wrote to me and they said, oh, there was a, one of the co-founders of Young Patriots, a guy named Junebug Boykin. Um, we had tried to get him in the film, but he didn't want to participate. And, and the, the gentleman who wrote was just basically saying, hey, yeah, um, he doesn't want to be involved with media because someone took a photo of him in 1970 with Fred Hampton, and then the police were trying to find him and beat him up. This is 1970. And they eventually found his brother who looks like him. They thought it was him. So they beat up his brother really badly. And so one of the founders of the Young Patriots packed up, moved to California, came back a couple years later, and then just never talked about being in the Young Patriots again. You know, they just, people, there's a fear that permeates a lot of these um, activists. And I had seen this before working on the film about Daruba bin Wahad, is there was an activist there who had become a Buddhist, uh, one of the members of the Black Panthers. And when we found him, he had changed his name. And he had said, yeah, I haven't talked about this in 50 years. because I mean, at the time, it was 40 years. He goes, because I didn't want anyone to know that I was still around. So that's the, I think, the legacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I think, the next film somebody needs to do is people for years, I mean, 10 years after, like in the 70s and the 80s, they would have a job. The FBI would come by their job in the 80s and say, hey, um, they would talk to their boss. Do you know that so-and-so is a radical activist? And they were arrested in the 80s. And they would be like, oh, we didn't know that. And they would get, they would get fired. And after 9-11, Chacha Jimenez was working with um, disabled people. And he had a steady job. Um, you know, he enjoyed it. He was good at it. And um, after 9-11, they were able to coordinate. They put a lot of money into coordinating all of the, the state databases. So they found him on the state database. He, he wasn't, you know, it was all paper before. And they, once they found that out, that he was an activist in the 60s, um, he got fired. And so, I mean, this is going into like the, the early 90s. It's crazy. I mean, the, the perpetual harassment of activists. Um, and the stuff that, that he was arrested for was, again, the stuff like, pro, you know, you can make up, like, when someone's getting arrested, it's like, uh, you know, they always come up with, like, four or five charges from the get-go. Yeah. And, and that's what his, uh, he's not arrested for, like, robbery or anything like that. It's all, it's all stuff that deals with activism. And so, anyway, I think that's, I think it's a legacy that I think that hopefully the next film can take care of. One of the good things I've heard is that they're doing another Eyes in the Price series, okay. which will pick up with the last two left off, there were two eyes in the prize series. And I think hopefully that'll go and tell more of those stories. And again, I, I'm glad they're doing it because they were at that pivotal time. And I believe that series is gonna go into the 80s, the 90s, and hopefully to today. Um, and I'm glad they're doing that again because we have these little windows and I think we're behind the curveball. Um, I think our, uh, my community, we're behind the curveball. We don't have enough filmmakers. We don't have enough historians. We don't have enough books to rely on so we can make these films easily. So it's like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I know there's a lot more PhDs being, um, coming out now, but it's all, everything coincides. Everything kind of works together. The more PhDs writing books, the easier it is for a filmmaker to make their, their historical we documentaries. Need, you need your work. Finish up yeah, your work. Yeah, so finish, <laughs> finish your... <laughs> but but you're, you're, you're speaking of state terror, and that state terror manifests itself deliberately in coordinated ways that you mentioned, but also in the, in the decentralized ways of individuals empowered with a badge and a gun, and um, we now are turning cameras against them because we have this, these phones. People from these neighborhoods uh, and these communities already know that that's not like a new thing. We just have phones now, we, you know, or VCRs when it was 
uh, Rodney King, uh, but these were going on, uh, and they were going on, uh, these, the, the police murders of, of the poor, uh, very many, uh, probably a disproportionate, black males, brown males, but also white males. I'm from Houston, and uh, Randy Webster was one of the first uh, uh, persons uh, who, who was, person who was killed by police uh, in which the incident was turned against the police because they, the police used uh, what they call a throwdown gun, and, and then it got traced to the property department of the Houston Police Department, and there was a mass protest. And, and, but it didn't coalesce like this one. This is happening to the poor. Right? It's happening specifically to, to black males, but it's happening to the poor across races. And I count that as an extension of a, a, you know, a democratic version of state terrorism, right? Uh, there's one thing related to that that, that you, you, your film reminds me of, and it speaks to your guerrilla filmmaker techniques. How in hell did you get a cop and an FBI agent to speak to you about this? This is amazing because you turned them on themselves in a brilliant way. How did, how did this come about? Well, the one um, um, black police officer, he was in Eyes in the Prize. That's how I knew about him. See, oh, okay. Okay. Eyes in the Prize, was, I had, when I originally thought of this, I originally had thought of this, I'm going to make my, the next Eyes in the Prize, <laughs> like the next episode. I kind of envisioned it as that. And, and there's only a couple, he, uh, Howard Saffold is his name. And, um, but, you know, he, he spoke out against the Chicago police force because... The, they had the, uh, the Black Policemen's Association, they had their own group. They had to sue the Chicago Police Force because of racism. So they were fighting their own internal battle within the Chicago Police Force. Uh, even they were police, they were being you know, treated badly and you know, the whole pay thing. And, and, um, but he was, uh, you know, it was kind of staying on him. Like, he'd say, like I'd call him and he'd say, oh yeah, I'll call me back in three months. And I'd call back in three months. And I stayed on it and luckily he agreed to do it. Now, the gentleman, um, Jack Ryan, he's an interesting guy in that if you look at the entire history of the FBI, there's only maybe five FBI agents that have ever spoken out about the FBI. The, the deal with him was that he was, he's, a devout, he's Irish, Irish-American, and he's a devout Catholic. And in the 80s, um, you know, there was the, um, the Catholic Church was doing a lot of help with organizations in El Salvador. And he was requested to do surveillance against some of these organizations that were helping out people from Latin America that were involved in these, you know. Um, the sanctuary uh, movement. Sanctuary movement. Yeah. And he was like, well, these are Catholic groups. I'm like, yeah, they're Catholic groups. We needed to surveil them. He's like, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm Catholic. And he refused to do it. So they fired him out like three months before his retirement. So he's, he, he gets zero retirement from the FBI because of that. Now he... Um, because he's such a, a you know, man of faith, he's like he volunteers now at the uh, church. I mean, he lives there. I mean, he doesn't really have a source of income. But luckily, and this is, I think it's extremely important to have those voices because if we have Chacha Menes saying, oh yeah, the police did this, the police did that, police, you know, everyone's going to say, okay, well, of course Chacha Menes is going to say that. But if you have the actual FBI people, you could, and he's saying, this is how we thought. We didn't care, you know, if you, you know, we didn't like you, we were going to stop you. And that's kind of was the mindset of the FBI. And, you know, all the documents say that. Um, you know, the agents that have spoken out all say the same thing. And how, having Howard, Howard Sockold, he had his own thing, was saying, hey, well, if you guys are, why are you guys destroying the Breakfast for Children's program when they're, it's a legitimate Breakfast for Children's program? And you just destroyed it. So he's navigating his own world. So those commentary, um, that commentary I think is extremely important. And that's why I wish I had the commentary of uh, one of the, that, that other member about how his brother was being up just because he was in a photo with Fred Hampton. I mean, that's, the, that's his crime, being in a photo with Fred Hampton. That's enough for the police to dish out um, beatings in Chicago. And that was the reality of Chicago. Um, and so that's, again, that there's little windows where you're trying to get set people back into a world that is maybe different from the world we're in now. But that, that was Chicago in 69, very, very violent place. Um, and a lot of these, um, you know, beatings and murders of activists. But, you know, it, it, again, it, it's, it's a great snapshot that you've done. You've captured it. You've brought it uh, alive. And again, it's, it's a reminder of a lot of conditions in a lot of different places. And you also reminded us of something that actually doesn't get talked about a lot. There is a great book called How the, How the Irish Became White. 
Uh, there's a lot of critical whiteness studies uh, that is really critical of, of, of how whites have been duped, some whites have been duped into being bigots um, against their own better interests. Uh, it's used to, you know, to, to disrupt union organizing and other coalitions. But what you've presented here, interestingly enough, in, in, in this case study, is you've given us Appalachians. And as, as I mentioned earlier, um, Appalachian uh, uh, young men in World War II had the same uh, mortality rates as Mexican-American young men in World War II. And we always focus on that because they're cannon fodder, right? And through all kinds of cultural, uh, 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 not traits, but the cultural practices or conceptions of, of uh, Latino masculinities, we get duped into being the warrior heroes, but so too the Appalachians. And the Appalachians were also racialized. Um, they were the ones, uh, you know, who, who also wound up, say, in the Battle of the Alamo. And we have a, a great friend in, in Texas, Rachel Jennings, an Appalachian poet, who um, writes about ancestors who were in the Battle of the Alamo escaping like the Irish did in the U.S.-Mexico War. The Irish turned... Uh, uh, they had been uh, uh, inducted into the U.S. Army and they were racialized and, and also racialized in terms of their spirituality, which was Catholic. And they turned and joined the Mexicans in the fight against the Americans. And the Appalachians have, have well, that's what I see when I see this, the, the affinity uh, for other peoples, other races who are living their conditions and their race, it's, sort of, it's a race class uh, dialectic, I would say. And they got it, Fred Hampton got it, Chacha Jimenez got it, Catherine Cleaver got it, uh, you didn't have Angela Davis, I thought one, one woman sounded like she was Angela Davis, but she got it. People, that, that was a, a, a huge obstacle uh, of the comparable racializations, however unique it is for each group, that once we unlock that puzzle of what is, as Fred Hampton said, what it is, what racism is, right? The symptom of capitalism. Uh, it's, it's, it's complicated, but it's a symptom of it and not the only problem. Uh, revolution becomes so possible, it's scary. Well, that, yeah. was, that was one of the things that I, that I saw in making it is that, making the film is that, um, and this is, you know, the folks from like High Thurman from the Young, Young Patriots would say this a lot is, you know, people write off the Southerners. I mean, even today, you know, it's like uh, everyone calls them rednecks and, you know, what do you call it? The folks who ride, drive the big trucks, you know, the NASCAR and all that stuff. But, you know, folks who listen to reason and, and folks can be organized. And I think that Fred Hampton, that was the genius of Fred Hampton, is yeah. he organized people who you wouldn't think you could organize. Like, who would imagine you could organize people with the Confederate flag? in 1969 Chicago, Fred Hampton thought that. And Fred Hampton, you know, sent Bob Lee to do that. And so, again, there were these, these little, you know, Bob Lee was from the South. So there's, you know, like, that was one of the things about the Judas and the Black Messiah. They had Fred Hampton going up there. Fred Hampton never went to Uptown where the Young Patriots were. That was all Bob Lee. So in some ways, it's like, I think Bob Lee should get some of the credit for it. He was the on the ground person. That, that was his area to organize, and he did it. He organized the Young Patriots. They became part of the coalition. Fred Hampton welcomed them in. But it was Fred Hampton's idea, but it was also the Black Panther's idea. Fred Hampton didn't come out of the blue and say, oh, well, we're going to do coalition politics. The entire Black Panther Party, if you were a chapter, were, were internationalists working towards coalitions and were anti-racist, because you had to be if you were going to be part of the Black Panthers. So I just think that, you know, everyone needs to recognize this. I think we need to, going to today, um, you know, we need to be aware of that within our own, our own internal racism with whatever, whatever community you're from. And, um, you know, I think, and I don't know whether it's everybody, but, you know, we're always afraid of some other group that we don't know about. If something strange or unfamiliar to us, sometimes we react by being frightened by it or angry about it. And I think we need to catch ourselves in that and think of the possibilities um, that could come with, if you're able to work with folks. And there are some folks you're never going to be able to work with. You know, going back to your comment, you said you wouldn't work with the folks with the Confederate flags. Um, um, Denise Oliver from the New York chapter, we did a couple of panels with her. And she said something I think is really interesting is she said that um, if, you're co if you're building a coalition and you're comfortable with everybody in your coalition, your coalition is probably not big enough. Hmm. 
you know, if you're really trying to expand, again, you're trying to build power and, and, and actually borrowing from the Judas and the Black Messiah, Black Messiah is where there's people, there's power. So you, got, you have to expand the, the boundaries of your coalition to maybe feel a little uncomfortable because the idea is not to, oh, we're all agreed 100%. The idea is to agree on enough to be able to work towards some kind of change that will benefit all those people in the coalition. So that was one of the things I learned. On that note, since the Black Panthers was such a, a, a profound uh, impetus behind this whole revolutionary era, uh, I think we're going to have to end. And I want to thank everybody for being here, and especially the, the uh, Carsey Wolf Center and the Pollock Theater for hosting us in, at the University of California at Santa Barbara and the Global Latinidades Center for also uh, providing resources to make this happen, and especially for Ray, for being here, for doing that work, um, and, and, and for the insights and for sharing and that whole ethos of making it happen, however we have to, to get the message out that so many people before us have, have, uh, have fought and have uh, modeled revolutionary possibilities for our day. So thank you again. Thank you, it's been great. Thank you.